When it comes to EVE Online, every player wants to know the most effective tactic available. You want to know the meta. The meta controls everything. It determines what will and will not happen. Knowing the meta will alter your views, make you question your reality. It might even make you laugh. And now, you're part of it. You're watching The Meta Show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Meta Show. I am Brisk Rabal. I am joined alongside this week by the Matani, as always. We also have two special guests with us today, Angry Mustache and Kazanir our favorite guys to talk about one of our favorite subjects, not really, and that is scarcity, what it's doing to the game, what it is, why we talk about it all the time, and when maybe it might end. But before we get to them. I'm invisible. Hi, boss. This is, this is wonderful. That's it. Uh, yeah, so I, I have an well, announcement. You're a little, you're a little, uh, uh, you're a little it, definitely ghosty today. I, I am ghosty. Let me, today. Let me see this, if I can unghost you a bit. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn the, the the lights in the front on more so I can be. This is actually a red shirt, guys. This is like a maroon shirt. But uh, hold, hold on, Mon. Got a cloaking device. There we go. We're doing it live, boys and girls. We are doing it live. All right. While he is doing that, I'm ladies and gentlemen, a couple of things. First of all, one happy birthday to our favorite almost number two guy, also Rampage Incorporated's fellow streamer, Merkel Chen. It is his birthday. He turns the big faux faux today. Happy birthday. He is now the same age as me. Yes, we are the same age. I know you won't believe that. But we love you, Merk. Happy birthday. Uh, soon I, I might, season, I might even be, be 44 uh, in July. I'm there the youngest go. of the might, here. Might be coming. So we want to get that all out of right. the way first. And now, boss, I want to turn it over to you because you have something very important to tell us all. I'm very excited about, I, about I this. I do. I, I have an honest to God big announcement. And for once, it's got very little to do with EVE Online. Um, and I've decloaked. This is this is good. I, I'm, no lo I'm no longer invisible. Uh, so if you heard about this at Vegas, uh, so here's the TLDR. We are soft launching. Uh, we're by we, I mean, me and my partner are soft launching this startup thing that we've been working on for like the last six months. Uh, a lot of you heard about this at Vegas. Some of you are involved in it directly. Uh, and we are finally at a point where we are able to reveal uh, madfern.com, which is all about interesting furniture for successful nerds. Uh, here's the, the TLDR on it. Uh, if you remember back in April, it was April or May, uh, when I kind of came out of the pandemic hidey hole and was like, I'm vaccinated and I'm going to spend some money to improve my life. Uh, and then it turned out that it was a real pain in the ass. I wanted to like redecorate my house and unfuck everything. Uh, and it seemed like every time I tried to go shopping to get stuff that actually looked cool, uh, I was like, I felt like I was in the girl's bathroom. I felt like I was in every time I go to a bed, bath and beyond, and I have to fight through like the live, laugh, love section. Uh, it just was a huge pain in the ass. Cause we're you no, know, if you are a successful nerd, the market is not aimed at you. Um, that's why the chairs are $2,000 guys. It's for successful oh, nerds. No. This is, okay. this is, this is aimed at people who this is not are your college dorm the, furniture. This is, this is not Doritos and Mountain Dew. This is for the kind of people that are, you know, a lot of us, um, want stuff that's nice, but we don't have to go through all the stuff. So anyway, the point is, uh, it is soft launching today. Let us know if you like what you see. Uh, unfortunately it is only for the continental United States at the moment. And it is uh, free shipping though, within the continental U S uh, and we have successfully sold the Adge a table. And so now that we have successfully moved a table to the Adge and Weaselor has blessed the business model, we are going to open it up a little bit. Let us know if you like it. Let us know if you don't like it. Uh, let us know if you see anything busted. Um, it's been a lot of work for the last six months. I'm really happy to finally be able to move some furniture around the universe. And uh, yeah, that's basically going to be it. Is madfern.com interesting furniture for successful nerds? It is live and uh, kick the tires on it. See if there's anything you like. I am that's quite it. looking that's, forward to this because I think it's going to be fun. For like the last six fucking months. It's well, been and insane. that's the thing. It's fun because, you know, a lot of us who work with Mittens on a daily basis, he will tell us, hey, I'm working on this. I'm working on this. He'll show us the mock-ups and we get to see, you know, how it's starting to look like that. And finally seeing it finally come together, get ready to go. 
That's pretty awesome. I'm looking forward to buying some furniture. If I can convince Mrs. Brisk we need any more, which is not always the easiest thing to do, <laughs> let me tell you. All right. So now right, let's, are, uh, let's dive into the Eve online. Let's talk about some today too, don't you, Brisk? We got are right. we doing are we doing the NFT rant? Uh, are that's we, my we that's where I'm, that's where we're going. NFTs? That's where All we're right. going right now. So okay. I'm gonna get on my soapbox. Well, before I get on my soapbox, one more thing. Okay. Shout out to our dear friends on the Goons AT team. We delayed the show so we could watch you guys get destroyed by tissue. I hope that that was strategic because the loser's <laughs> bracket's easier. But we love you anyway. I think it is complete bullshit that the Alliance tournament does not allow us to demonstrate our strengths. I'm going to be pushing next year for the Goons to be allowed to bring 1,100 people to the AT. It's not fair when we can only bring 10. That's not our strength. Anyway, all right. With that little bit of fun, let's talk about let's talk about what is frustrating me today. What could that possibly be? We're gonna get up. I'm gonna get up on my soapbox. I'm gonna talk a little bit about non fungible tokens. You guys know what non fungible tokens are? I hope not, because if you do, you're a bigger nerd than me. But for the Alliance tournament, for the first time, CCP is going to be creating, in partnership with a cryptocurrency, the first non-fungible tokens for the AT. They will be given out as trophies to the winners of matches. Every time someone gets a kill, their kill mail will be immortalized. And here you can see what it looks like, what it's going to look like. Here is what it's going to look like. Vicky Victim eliminated by Killy McKilla. They lost the Knicks. This will be an official permanent thing, I guess, on the internet. And you can trade them. Now, if this sounds to you like it's completely stupid, I understand that. If it sounds to you like this is a complete waste of money, that is true. If it sounds to you like this is the absolute worst thing that CCP has ever done and people should cancel their accounts and walk away, you, sir, are a dipshit. This is not even close to being the worst thing that CCP has ever come up with. Yet, if you didn't know any better, based on the way that Reddit looked and the forums looked, not only was CCP conspiring with the nefarious forces across the world to destroy the environment, they were also participating in Ponzi schemes and trying to fleece unsuspecting EVE players. And they were going to get EVE taken off Steam because Steam doesn't allow NFTs. Now, listen, is this dumb? Yes. Are NFTs in general dumb? Yes. Why would you spend money on something that doesn't actually have any value? And I think the best way I heard it discussed was NFTs is basically a way for you to pretend that you have complete ownership over someone over something and that nobody else is allowed to pretend that they have complete ownership over that thing. It's just, it's just dumb. But you know what? People said the same thing about cryptocurrency when it started. And now people are making billions of dollars off of it. Now, I don't think this is a big deal. I don't think it's worth the oxygen. The fact that I even spent two minutes of it on the meta show is probably more attention than it deserved. But what I would say is we're going to talk about a lot of things on this show that absolutely should be things that you pay attention to. Things like scarcity, things like re mineral redistribution, changes to the meta, changes to balance, those types of things. That's the stuff that should get you angry. That's the stuff that should get your panties in a bunch. Not this nonsense that's really going to apply to just a couple hundred people playing in the NT, the AT, if they care. So let's keep our powder dry and hold off to complain about the stuff that really matters, because if we spend all of our time complaining about stuff that doesn't, they're not going to listen to us. That is my soapbox for the week, and I'm going to shut up now. And we're going to move on to the top story of the week. This is our conversation with Kazanir and Angry Mustache about scarcity, Quadrant 4, and what, we're, what, we, what we may see and what we may not see. So here we go, right after we do the little button thing that I push. All right, ladies and gentlemen, our top story, as I noted, is scarcity, what it is, what it's doing, why we don't like it, and what we hope to see in the future. 
this is going to be a, a discussion show. Mittens and I are probably going to shut up a little bit. We're going to talk to Kaz and Angry Mustache because these are two of Goon Swarms and the Imperium's smartest guys when it comes to economy stuff. They've both been on the show before, and I want to turn it over and let them talk a little bit about it. But the thing I want to kick off the discussion with is we talk about scarcity all the time. And I have conversations with players on a daily basis complaining about different aspects of the game that have changed in the last two years that they don't like. And we talk about scarcity as this catch-all, but I don't know if we're all working off the same definition. Because I hear a lot of people complaining about scarcity as, well, dreads cost too much, or capital production is borked and doesn't work, or the cost of supers and titans is three times what it was a couple years ago. But then I also hear people complaining about the EHP nerf to supers, but makes them easier to kill. I hear people talking about the removal of asteroid belts. I hear them talking about changes to the size and the ore types in belts, the increased use of gas and PI and different types of, of, of industry and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot going into this. So I want to talk to you guys about it. What is scarcity all of this stuff? Is it some of this stuff? What's the worst part? What has been the impact Mustache and Kaz, I'll let you guys take it over and yell at me when you want slides and stuff because I want to hear what you guys have to say. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna let's directly so let's we'll start with Kazanir. How do how do we define scarcity in this? Are we talking about the 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 material impacts? Uh, That's the it. Manufacturing costs. Are we talking about this? Like let's kind of let's kind of also just FYI, guys. I've brought these guys on here. Brisk and I brought these guys on here because we can't be mean enough to CCP in the right ways. Right, because I'm not an industry guy. Brisk is not an is industry guy. He's on the CSM. I'm a space politician, right? But at this point, it's like, okay, we need to get the actual fucking experts on here and tell them in their own language, in their own words of you know industry prod finance, to just take the gloves off and say whatever uncomfortable truths you guys want to say about the situation. Uh, and pull no punches uh, as far as, as Iceland is concerned. Uh, so, Kazanir, uh, let's start with you. W what are we yeah, doing? Yeah, I mean, start. this might be the start of like a two- or a three-week special, I think, with how much is happening. Uh, it's it's an interesting question, right? I want to thank thanks, Brisk, for the kind words. I want to stress that, that both Angry and I are kind of idiots who have ended up here uh, and have been lucky to have goon swarm at our backs. I don't want to take any credit really. I, I hadn't played the game for years. I missed sort of many of the, the Delve Haiti years. And so scarcity for me has been a uh, sort of process of examining both what, what led up to it. How did the game work in the, the quote abundance years, but then what actually did happen. And it really turns out to be probably a, a dozen different mechanical changes, right? And, and I would actually start the conversation all the way back at the blackout, which is not really part of it. No one was saying scarcity. They they introduced that term, uh, I think, with the ore changes about six months later in the beginning of, of 2020, right? Uh, and that was when they started talking about that as a thing. And they said, well, we really feel like there's there's too much abundance. And they said, we the player economy is at risk of going out of control somehow. There was no real detail on what that meant right but it was that they they felt they said there there's too much happening and we feel like the capital proliferation in particular is going to get out of control and and they said that the player organizations will have too much power again no specifics it was almost sort of like uh don't know how to put a boogeyman style like th this needs to be reined in and that the mineral nerfs were enough to uh, essentially stop capital capital proliferation at the time, right? Uh, that was the, the first step was changing ore such that there was not very much uh, in null stack in general compared to what there had been. Uh, you did not have the amounts coming out of moons in terms of Tecmon minerals. And, and that's what you needed to build, you know, Titans and super carriers. And that put an end to that rate of building. You could still get them, uh, but prices started to go back up as these mineral stockpiles started to get run through. And that was really the first step. Uh, so there, there's a number of additional steps, but that was the beginning, right? It's, it was about capital proliferation. That was the meta discussion at the time. And it was about putting a, a clamp down on how fast people could build both caps and super caps for a variety of reasons. Like we could talk about all that, but it starts with the, the ore stuff. Uh, but what's interesting is, is right before that, they also made a bunch of changes to Sinos. 
uh, and capital ships and how that behaves in a period right after the blackout that sort of gets forgotten. We all went to just recon ship sinos. And that was also focused on capital proliferation and what the mechanics are, uh, stuff that was a, a big metagame discussion at the time. Right. So that's that's the beginning. I'll let Angry do some more bullet points. So I don't have bullet points, but I have like a wider definition of scarcity, which is that scarcity is a series of misguided changes CCP has implemented to combat a normal game phenomenon that they convince themselves is a problem. Um, and basically everything Kazner has said falls under that umbrella that they that they convince themselves that players getting older and wealthier is bad, that they convince themselves after 10 years of this in, a, in an environment where people are expected to accumulate wealth and experience and skill points, that the average player wealth going up is a bad thing. And that's, that is, um, that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, I completely agree uh, that, I mean, that really, uh, in particular, when I say capital proliferation, right, that was a situation where, as we know, all of a sudden, we Goonswarm had just won a couple of big wars. There were a thousand Titans on the field, right? Everyone was talking either about that or about how well you would come to delve and get super capitals dropped on you. And a lot of the metagame was a discussion of those mechanics, right? But that really is a discussion of power creep. It wasn't like that power creep in the game wasn't already happening, right? Just a couple of years before that, we had already seen the biggest Titan fight ever in BTEC R5, right? Um, power creep has, has been a thing throughout Eve's history, uh, but all of a sudden it, it got a little bit larger in a short span of time with how Rourke Walls and T1 mining worked. And there was a, a, a essentially metagame wide overreaction right to that and i think that's where scarcity starts uh, like angry is saying right and the other fundamental part is that um is that if they had an economist on board they would sort of pat and you told that economist we've had a period of hyperinflation and our plan to fix this is deflation they would tell you to get out of the room the uh <laughs> right hyperinflation exactly. is a real world phenomenon but every but the accepted um fix for hyperinflation has been a currency revaluation. And in video game terms, that's sort of like uh, you would, uh, that's sort of like cr crunching, so to speak. A uh, number squish. Numbers right, crunching yeah. is that you accept that what has happened has happened and that this is going to be the new normal and we're going to balance around that. Uh, so this is sort of why you have in games like, wow, you have number crunching. You know, once things get out of hand, you reset to a new normal and you continue. And the advantage of that over deflation is that deflation is fundamentally bad for everyone who started new. Eve is one of the most unique games there are. And I say unique not in a good way is that mm -hmm. Eve has a tradition of solidifying early mover advantages at the expense mm -hmm. of anyone who joined later. And that's part of the issue that contributes to Eve's retention problem is that it's always been the case in Eve that accumulated advantages do not depreciate. And over time, what that causes is continuous, is that accumulated advantages accumulate and accumulate without, without anyone that came after having a way to combat it. So um, just to draw another example, it's one of the few games in existence where a ship built 13 years ago is still as impactful or more impactful than it is now. It is a scenario... It is a game where a lottery 14 years ago still has a significant effect on the game today because there's been no way to get T2BPOs ever since. And like people meme about it, but for some things, T2BPOs are still impactful. And it would be sort of, and it's sort of unthinkable that the early move advantage is this strong. And when, and when newer upstarts, encounter that so they encounter that bit of knowledge they get sort of very discouraged by that because if you've asked if you had new players look at a capital ads how do i get one the answer right now is you don't you don't you don't and and then who thought that was a good idea how was uh right? how so you wonder why eve has a retention problem and that's one factor contributing to it so when right. I, we talk about scarcity I think the, the important thing that players need to realize, and I'm showing some, I'm, what I'm flipping through on the screen here are 
a number of the dev blogs that have gone up in the last two years talking about it. But I, I still recall sitting in the CSM Summit in, in I want to say it was September of 2018, going over all this stuff with CCP Larrick, and this is all in the minutes, so it's not a secret. And they, thro they throw on the screen, you know, the MER, and we're looking at its generation numbers for the last six months, seven months. And I point blank asked him, is this sustainable? And he said, no. And then I said, well, what are we going to do about it? Or what are you going to do about it is what I should have said. And what we saw starting then, and I think this is important to highlight because there's been a, a difference of opinion over the last two years or so. I think the players have a different view than CCP does, but CCP makes the final decision, so they went with what they went with. And I think Mustache and Kazanier pretty much summed that up pretty well, but I want to get into the, a little bit more detail with that with them on this, some of this stuff. But the mm -hmm. list of things that has happened to impact the economy in the last two years is absolutely insane. It starts with an excavator nerf. They change the anomaly respawn rate to reduce the, the amount of the, uh, how many anomalies can respawn. You have blackout. You have changes to fighters that make it much harder to survive and do what you're doing with fighters on a super carrier when you're ratting without paying attention. You have changes then to player ships. You have the EHP nerf that was huge that resulted in a lot of the big ships losing a quarter of their survivability. Now, that was, I guess, supposed to help deal with proliferation, but in the end, it, it really just made people crab up and not use them as often. And I think we saw that even during the war, the number of, of actual super cap engagements where both sides had a real chance to lose was maybe four in a year-long mega war between two-thirds of the game. Yeah, and, and that metagame was already developing, right? Like the, the jammer heavy warfare that we saw for all of, of Vietnam that had developed in the prior war with, with Test of Fraternity, right? Uh, due to people wanting to avoid risk and, and not wanting to throw down when, when they know they're going to lose so and so much, right? So right. everyone will try and do that. So in addition to this, you see, we have, we, in addition, they changed the types of ore and asteroids. They move stuff around so you couldn't just mine one thing. They changed... They removed all the basic ore from moons. So you saw complete ore redistribution. You saw the introduction of the dynamic bounty system. You saw the introduction of uh, the encounter surveillance system in every system in the game. You saw the industry redesign where they changed how everything is made, including adding big stop gaps. I shouldn't say stop gaps, adding big, what's the word I want to use? Basically blocking points where yeah, absolutely. PI, like water and and different P1, P, PI, like level one you can, materials. You can call it a supply chain problem. I think right. we're at that point. Choke point is what I'm looking for. Thank you so much, Redline. So they, they create the choke points, and then everybody starts complaining about how bad PI is because all of a sudden now everybody has to do it. You know, they do that. They change the market fees. They, they fiddle with the market fees that killed off the TTT for a while and I guess it's coming back. You know, it's it's they have they have literally pushed and prodded and poked at every little single aspect of the economy trying to fix a problem that I don't even know if we can really put our fingers on what it was what they were trying to do. And I think for the most part for many players this has this has not been fun. They they have not enjoyed what has been happening. And I think the result has been that once the war was over, you know, it, we're kind of at this point now where everybody goes back to crabbing and then they realize, wow, they really messed this stuff up. It's not what it was well, before we started the war. Happens next? How are they going to do it? Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Hey, uh, have, and have it's... you mentioned the first name, last name situation? Like, have we talked about the, the just lack of market volume in Jita across a number of sectors yet on the show? Well, I think we're going to sort of drop the hammer with n those numbers at the end. Actually. Okay. All right. Yeah, cool. I have then a chart. I'll, yeah. I'll keep it powder dry. You do that. it. All right. Keep on, keep on pounding on. Good. Yeah. Uh, so I, and I think what I want to come back to what Bruce said, the number of things here is stretches across so many game mechanics right it, it's every different aspect of the game not just the economy but how the game works like stuff like hp nerfs right to supers that supposedly is like a tactical thing about like pvp combat but dramatically influenced 
will dramatically influence the gank ability of a super buy a, a bomber gang, right? And that dramatically influences whether they can PVE, dramatically influences whether the Care Bearers are demanding that ship class. Well, that ship class is very large. It takes a lot of materials to build. All of a sudden, the Care Bearers are not demanding that ship class. That what, There's no replacement for super carriers in the amount of demand that is, right? Every super carrier built is a certain amount of money that had to go through a chain of stuff to get built. All of a sudden, they're not not taking them out as much because there aren't any, you know, they're going to get ganked much more easily. It's harder to defend them. Alliances are saying, don't put your super out there. As soon as that happens mechanically, because that makes sense, the, the economic impact of that downstream is just dramatic, right? So there are all these different things that factor into, well, the economy isn't as good, but no, no one thing, and except for, there's an exception to this, but almost no one thing is the thing that that is stopping everything right so the one thing at first was the mineral nerfs you couldn't just go and mine enough of all the minerals you needed to make a super or a titan and null sec anymore you had to go to low sec and then all of a sudden the war was on and, and just not very many were being built but what replaced that is the industry redesign with with Feldistry. I forget the real name of the patch, even that it was called, right? That dramatically changed industry how update. all capitals are built. It, it's that they called it industry they industry didn't even update. Have a, an expansion name? I, I don't even think right. it was an expansion. So <laughs> industry update. Uh, yeah. The, but the upshot was to not only make the increase dramatically the just the raw bill of materials to build every capital and super capital, but dramatically increase the skill requirements, add a new set of blueprints and a new way of doing things. But as it turned out on top of that, a number of the uh, internal computations were broken. So it was overcharging job fees by a factor of, I think, four or five for some time. So you would be paying essentially instead of paying whatever your index percentage was, where it says 3% and you're going to pay 3% of the job cost to to build that thing right all of a sudden all of these intermediate layers were charging you something more like 15 or 20 percent of your bill of materials costs due to ccp's internal numbers being wrong right so you have that portion plus the build the materials actually needed are not can't be produced by players in the amount that it is needed to actually produce any of these at scale right if you went and if i went and took a, a bill for 200 dreadnoughts and the amount of stuff that goes into it, all the new stuff that was added, there just isn't the amount of, of stuff like P1s, uh, PIP ones, water and oxygen in the in on the market in the universe to build that stuff. Uh, same problem with some of the T3 stuff to go and actually build a, a fleet of dreadnoughts or a new you know group of super carriers. There just isn't that amount of stuff on the market, and it's not like you can go and respawn those anomalies faster you can't go and cycle a wormhole anom and you can't go and cycle a planet faster uh there's no sort of economic valve for this so all this stuff stacks up and and that sort of is the hammer on the end of everything is to say oh no one knows how to build a capital anymore at all and actually if you investigate doing it you're going to find that it is going to take player effort that is not profitable and can't scale to the level you need to support and this is the key point right all of this is created by trying to compete with a player with a power curve evolution by saying players have built so and so many capitals, so and so many supers, so and so many thousand titans, right? But to, to nerf that by saying we're going to make them dramatically harder to build, right, just leaves those in place. And, and so that leaves the game essentially stagnant from the strategic perspective because no one has the ability to go and, and challenge those existing power holders. And there's no way out of that, right? So I appreciate that everyone looks at the, the power curve increasing and goes, wait a minute, like EVE is not this inflationary game, right? And I agree with that, actually. The speed at which sort of everyone was able to build a Titan, does, you know, that has a power curve implication. But the way to fix that is not to go and say, we're going to just deflate everything because, the, you know, we see what you get from that. You get a game which has two years of a sort of malaise as half of its economy disappears, right? Yep. The answer to everyone having a tech one Titan is not to make all Titans cost four times as much. It's to say, maybe there is a tech two Titan out there that costs four times as much. And we can expand the game's power curve in a game in a way that'll last us another 10 years. But that's right? actually worth being four times as much. We have faction Titans that don't exactly. increase in terms of usability <laughs> enough to justify the amount of money. They become hangar toys and they become prestige. They're the Rolex watches 
out there. And folks don't need a Rolex, they need a Timex because we want to be able to fight and blow these things up. And that's that's kind of the issue. Now, if you look on the screen here, I, this is funny. I, I pulled up the significant update to industry is what they called this. And they said they're, cha they're making all of these changes. The bullet points that they did it is this will create more robust and interesting manufacturing progression, allow for better compartmentalization in the manufacturing process between subcaps, caps, and supercaps, revitalize the importance of R4s, increase the importance of wormholes, and allow wormholers to be a catalyst in New Eden's environment, positively impact cap proliferation, impact the whole economy of New Eden, and lay the foundations for future resource distribution. Mustache, did they do any of that? Did any of that actually happen? Um, I will say they actually have increased, they have improved the structure so that it can happen, uh, so that if they get the numbers right in the future, they have the tool, they have the, um, their blue, it's it's a right direction in, in concept. It's not a right direction in execution because their numbers are off by quite a bit. Um, <laughs> He's being very kind. He's right? being kind. And I will, well, I will say. There are, there are lots of more mean things I can say, but as far as please, please, this please. goes. Um, Weapons free. Uh, separating uh, subcap and capital production chains. They have done that, not, uh, but the but they have technically done that, but they haven't made capitals viable. Uh, they have revitalized the importance of R four moons. They technically have done that, but you ha capital has to be, has to be buildable first. Uh, robust and interesting manufacturing progression. Yes, again, they technically have done that by making it more skill uh, intensive and making it more complex, but they've done it to a point where that's not doable. And uh, let's see, the last one. Uh, lay the foundation resource distribution. They actually have done that too because what they have, what what I've noticed, one thing they've done is they've sort of reduced, uh, they've made all the resources more focused. So you don't have byproducts, and the benefit of that is that uh, when you have byproducts, it makes the it makes the activity specialized in getting those things worthless because they're just byproduct. They're because if they're available as byproducts from something else, they're not worth doing on their own. However, they also have not changed how the usage of any of those byproducts so they're still not going to be useful for a very long time and the example here is for example they've made null sex or specialized in megasite and zydrine and the issue with that is they were byproducts for about 15 years so and they have not increased the usage of those so for the next you know i would say at least five years, null sec minerals are not going to be worth mining. Because yeah, let me zoom out. This is why is a byproduct. This was is why ABC is garbage now, right? Is for the longest time there was an excess of everything, and so there's an excess of that stuff, and so there's just nothing valuable in null sec except for morphite, and so right. we have to do arcane mining rules to get people yeah. to mine the garbage, right? Uh, and that's that's an economic strength of ours. That is a key to how to help operate it is that we can get people to behave in certain ways and trying to juice our, our behavior for a better economy. But that's actually kind of arcane, right? That That's a reason why he favors players like us, and it puts up a, a wall to people who are trying to, to yeah. get into it, right? And I would say so overall, when I, so when I hear, the theme, sorry. When, when I hear you say, technically they've done that, <laughs> it sounds very much like Pappy saying, we won the war according to the EULA. Yeah, I, I mean, mean did, the, it, did it did did they I mean technically maybe but I here's the thing like technically they did this but in the end all of these changes like creating more robust and interesting manufacturing all that kind of stuff the whole idea behind it as far as I can tell is let's make the game more fun and interesting for people who have gotten used to it let's shake it up a little bit and make things different and so there I don't think they I don't think that they have made it more fun. They've made it different. They've changed things, but in doing so, I I I can't in good conscience say that industry now is more fun and engaging gameplay than it was 2 years ago. And I think as the as the end customer of all the industry guys, I certainly don't think making them go through more work to get me a ship is that much more fun for them and it's definitely not any funner for me. More fun for me, funner, funner, more fun for me. I'm kind of at the point where I see like every time they set up themselves up for these goals, they technically hit the goals, but they do it in a way that 
makes things not as good as it was before or not as fun as it was before. And and the end result is people don't like it. And even if they say, well, yeah, you did this, but that's not, that's not fun. It's not fun. And, and the result is people stop playing and we have tons of examples in the chat of players who are still here, who care enough about Eve to watch the meta show on four o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, but who don't sub their accounts anymore because they don't, Love they don't feel all. like they want to play. Uh, I would say that is true in that um, uh, the thing about a system like Eve, right, is that it's so complex that nobody um, the, nobody can call the impact of a change from just the patch notes or the devs. So that's why um, when Team Talos had the right idea of doing rapid iterations, but this is something that needs ra rapid iterations the most, and it's just not been iterated on. It's been almost it's been six months since the initial set of capital changes and that uh brisk can you drop can you bring up the production i want me to pull graph? up the production numbers mm -hmm. now I, I was getting ready for that yeah. that's why oh, the screen's all go. goofy here we go here we go yeah. we are stashing it up now uh, not that one next one next one no that's capital kills next one that there there's production go. numbers all right oh right. you passed yeah. it I'm past it. Sorry. That one. Yeah. So there's production numbers. So you see from that drop off that, uh, so the peak right there you see is the two months leading up to the capital changes. And after that, it's fairly safe to say that capitals just haven't been built. Um, and, and that's a scenario that should be concerning to CCP because when, a halt in production is not only a halt of end products, but it's also a halt in demand for the people who are supplying the raw materials. So people that used to, you know, mine minerals for to that used to go into capital ships, they don't do that anymore. Their gameplay is dead. Um, and and I don't know if it's a good thing to say, but MMOs are habit forming activities. The mm -hmm. when you when you get someone. You, it's hard to quit. Once you quit, it's hard to get them back to start back up. And when CCP just had just put creates this environment where people stop, and then it's fairly arrogant to think, oh, once we fix this in two years, they'll start back up. There, it's some people just are they're 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 they they've stopped. Um, they've quit the habit. Right. And, and it is it's like a numbers game, right? It's not that. The, it's not that mining was destroyed as gameplay. It's just that there was substantially less demand for what mining generates. And the way that works is that that means fewer people will do it. And that's what, that's what macroeconomics is, is the study of supply and demand and how many people will do a given thing at a given price at any given time and how frequently and so forth. Right. And what this graph is showing is demand being shattered, right? You have 200 trillion in production before any of these changes right and then at, at the you know at the bottom of blackout in the on the left side of the graph is that first sort of trough right and you're down to just over 100 trillion at, at the, the trough of blackout and now here after the the big fight in m2 and these changes and, and part of that spike is building before the patch right but then after that we're well under 100 trillion and barely back up to that now in peacetime right these changes are the story of half of eve's economy being destroyed, but that's not just, uh, you know, a hundred trillion less in ships is being produced a month. It's all of the player activity that went into supporting that hundred trillion in production. It, it goes somewhere else, right? It, it might go to people faffing off on sissy. It might go to people running abyssals. We haven't even talked about that, about how abyssals can replace a lot of this income in a very solo instanced way, right? Yep. Uh, some of that activity obviously went towards the war, right? It's not all of this chart is scarcity. Some of it is the war, but the war is also driving us to produce half of what is on that chart, right? So there's a, a mix there. What we see is that all of these things stacked together have not really fixed anything. Uh, and that this missing piece of capital production is what is missing from the EVE economy. All of this additional juice was people spending outsized amounts, you know, capitals and super capitals before all the changes still cost dramatically more than the next closest ship, right? All of that just being missing is the player activity that is making people feel like 
ETH is slow now. And that's what, what uh, FNLN was saying when he talked about the market, when he was saying, you know, I, I have all of this stuff listed on the market. I have so and so many hundreds of billions, but now I'm seeing all of these products that are moving, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50% of what they used to be. Yeah, 30, 40, 50%. Is that the end of the world for his operation? No, but that's the story of aggregate demand. No, any given thing is the end of the world, but at the end, you look at your economy and half of the player activity is missing, and that's not good. So, and I think it's funny that, that I mean, that if you look yeah. at this chart, the funniest thing about this chart is the biggest spike in production since 2019. The only thing that they did that sparked production was announced that they were changing all the minerals, uh, changing all the, uh, the industry impacts. Like yeah, how you right. build stuff created this massive push where everybody built as much stuff as they could under the old system before the new system came in. And they're still sitting on those stockpiles of stuff because it's all just sitting there because it's not selling. So I, I I thought that that was that was one of the more amusing things about the whole thing. We're not seeing I, at least I don't think we're seeing the benefits that have been touted from this. And well, well, it's frustrating to me because I feel like we're losing players now. The war ended. We had the opportunity, like a lot of people that came out here, for example, and came back specifically for the war, but they come and they see a different game and they see a new game and it's different and it's got different players, and, but they like it. They're having fun. They're enjoying the time with their friends. Then the war's over. There's no reason to have fleets every night. And they go back to wander off to where they're doing again and we lose them. And that sucks because I feel like we had a great opportunity with the war. It was a very good way to get people interested. But between CCP's changes to the economy and Pappy's war strategy, the result was everybody got bored and all the folks that came back quit. And I don't know what we're going to do to get those players back because I think it's more important or as important to get those players back as it is to get new players in the game. But they spend, CCP spends most of their time working on stuff designed to get new players in and less about trying to entice players who played before to come back. And I think that is a more fertile ground for them to make money than trying to bring in new players, especially in, in 2021. A player that's, that played in 2013, 2014, has an account, has been around, no stuff, that has more value to them than somebody brand new starting out. But that's my take. Also, hello, Shell Tark. It's good to see my boy in chat. Cheers. Uh. Um, we have other slides. Do you guys want to talk about these other slides? Because... I think you guys have a ton of keep, data here. Keep, keep sure. beating on him. Like I, I you sure. know, I don't speak into industry, but everybody seems to be cheering on what these guys are saying. So fucking preach. These are the best financiers good in the galaxy. From, Maybe do we have somebody any good, like CCP should listen to them. Do we have any good questions from chat? I haven't been able yeah, to look guys, because yeah. my brain can only do um, 75% yeah, of the I guess thing you, at a time. you can do that and I can go over the slides. So th this one's pretty hard to, fairly hard to read, but this is overall destruction in EVE for all sectors of space. A pro if I realized that uh, it's going to be not full screen, would I would have made the f thing a bit more readable. But basically, 2018 is on the very left, and um, right now is on the very right. And what you see is uh, there is a drop off that starts in Q3 of 2019. That is the start of serious scarcity. And Q1 2021 is the lowest trough that Eve has had in terms of destruction. And then in Q2. Eve is the activity goes up not because of anything CCP did, but because of the pandemic. Everyone's locked in. And then the pandemic drops off after a bit until the war starts. And you see this destruction spike mainly in NullSec. So this dark blue is NullSec. And all of this is due to the war. And then once the once the war ends, I think we're gonna see a new normal that's even lower than 2019. And I don't think that CCP hasn't realized um that the war and the pandemic was covering the true consequences of a lot of their changes mm -hmm. until both are over yeah, and, absolutely and, and not all of their changes were even tested in an outside of wartime environment right like the right. felder street in particular we had never seen and the immediate effect of that was that no one was going to deploy super capitals in, in a scenario that they didn't control like that it was almost yep. determinative Right, we haven't even touched on this, right? But the the change in we'll touch on that war next strategy. Slide. Yeah. We'll okay. Touch on okay. Next okay. Slide. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> getting ahead of your talk. Go ahead. So this is the uh, if if it's readable at all. The, this is the number of ships that are lost every month for for, for capitals. Not uh, so these are dreadnoughts, carriers, force auxiliaries, and super carriers. Since these are ships that are in space more often, and Titans generally sit on a tether. 
uh, most of the time, so they're not lost. Um, but what you see is that yellow line for carriers, that starts falling for, for carriers destroyed per month. That starts falling from the start of 2019. And after the mineral changes, you see them here, it just, and especially the industry changes. So uh, around, you can see that drop at the mid of 2021. And what that shows is that about people are not dumb. They realize if an asset is irreplaceable or hard to replace, they will stop utilizing them. And carriers is the biggest example because carriers are the most utility for PVE. So what you see is that PVE carriers have been completely phased out because people realize they're not usable. And what that also implies is that the content for people that used to kill 800 carriers a month is gone. There is nothing replacing that. And hundred Jesus. Yeah. It used to be. At, now at it's peak, uh, right? Yeah, yeah, at yeah, peak yeah. it's eight hundred, and now it's around one hundred and fifty to two hundred. Okay. Yeah. So that is so this this downward slope is not only uh, people using less; it's people demanding less because if you lost a carrier, you want it back. Uh, so that's gone, and content for killing carriers is gone. Dreadnoughts similar downward curve, but not to an extent because dreadnoughts have less PVE utility, and they are more strategically important in ways that get them killed while carriers sit on Tether and Skynet. Uh, so that's that one. Next graph, please. This we've talked about. We can move on to the next one. So this, uh, again, I should have made the legend bigger. So this is sort of showing the fundamental reason why CCP's I goal of sharing the wealth from industry for capitals is unworkable because um, the components that go into a capital ship cannot be moved at all. Um, so what I have here is, is the construct. These are all based off the construction of a revelation, and these are two different methods of sourcing parts. So, for, so, so how to read this is when you look at step one buy that says, if you want to build a revelation and you buy every single thing that's needed, this is how big it is. It's seventy It's seven hundred seventy thousand M three, which is three jump freighters worth. Now, some of these are, you can sort of see the predominance of some of them. So for example, this keel for PI, that's mostly water in that 0 0.41, in that uh, 400,000 M3. And, but what you realize is when you actually build these draws in a component, it gets smaller, but not much smaller. You save only a little bit, which, which sort of shows that, um, and the, uh, actually, I should, I should go on the next one. And then third, and the third step is once you build all those things into capital parts, the size balloons up to almost 2 million M3, which is seven jump freighter loads. And if you know something about jump freighters is that they're actually quite expensive to run. This 2 million M3 is an unmovable volume of stuff. All of that is being built in the same station or the same engineering compound that you are building your dreadnought in. So what this, so, so what this means is a lot of stuff in EVE gets bigger before it gets smaller, so you want to move them in the early steps, which means you cannot outsource that to someone else. And the graph on the right has is a, is fairly similar, but I also chose to – this is subcontracting out everything that can be contracted out, but that still doesn't solve the fact that capital parts at the end is unmovable. So all of that building you have to do yourself. And – and in the lower one, it's, a, it's the same process, but it's showing the number of items to keep track of, which is a proxy for effort, right? Because uh, saving uh, the a lot of limits in Eve is effort limited because capsuleers are all powerful, but you, the player, has a has limited mental capacity. You sort of see what CPU is going for. I certainly in that have every, limited mental capacity. Let me tell you. In that Word. every step of the process reduces the number of parts. However, the biggest reduction happens. So this is like if you're keep if you're buying all raws, so you have to keep track of 80 items and set up buy orders and ship them, and that's too many for anyone to manage unless they have a problem. Um, <laughs> at, at the next step, it does it reduces, but not that much, and only only really falls down to something manageable at the capital parts step where you have 15 capital parts to keep track of. At the same time, that's also the step that's not movable. So you have these two conflicting designs ramming into each other, and the end result is that vertical integration is still the way to go. So mm -hmm. they seem to think that they have designed a system that makes hauling more fun and and creates a, a definite integrated 
supply chain for the space truckers. But the reality is the stuff that needs to move is too big to move, and we don't have ships that can it's, move it in a cost-effective way. So nobody does it. It's total nonsense. Right. It's total nonsense. That and, makes and perfect sense you have to, me. to It makes anytime you have to move something in EV, you made a mistake, right? Yeah. And nothing about that has changed. And they could one overhaul thing, it to get there, but they have not. And one more thing is they say they want to spread out industry so that most people are involved and it's collaborative. But at the same time, they just spike sales taxes. So anytime you're buying something from someone else, instead of making it yourself, you are paying a broker fees, which are broker fees and sales taxes, which have just been increased. So it's left hand talking, not talking to right hand. Next slide, please. All right. There you go. So this is the other one thing I was talking about when they're when so they want to address um, when they say oh you know there's too much is coming in or there's too much whatever coming in is that is that Eve is so complex and interrelated that changing one thing doesn't necessarily change that thing it pushes people off into others so what you see here mm -hmm. is the total is faucet from uh, the most popular activities that generate is right. And what you see here is after the initial shock of blackout in around mid-2019, that's the big dip you see in the le left-hand side of the graph, people adapted. What they did was they immediately realized that NullSec, which is this red portion that you see fluctuating the most, is, no is, the in is in CCP's target, and it's no longer what you should rely on. So what they did was they diversified. So very quickly, although NullSec didn't shoot back up to the level that it was before, they compensate, people compensated by moving their income sources to something else. So these are commodities, which are generally wormholes, incursions, and later on you see the rise of Pockman all the way on the right. And you see that too on the on the on the second null sec dip, which is DBS, dynamic bounty system. And you see this dramatic drop, but the overall effect on the IS faucet is much less pronounced, and it recovers in a couple months because people have already prepared by doing more wormholes, by doing more incursions. So because they have completely neglected almost every other portion of the, uh, of the ISK faucet environment, uh, all scarcity has done is, in, is affect uh, a specific portion of space without really affecting how much money comes in or the sink faucet balance, which we'll get to on right. the next slide. Yeah, exactly. If you look specifically at the numbers, right, in January 2019 is sort of our pre-nerf, pre-anything starting point. NullSec is at around 85 trillion, right? And now at the end of our chart, it's maybe 35 billion. So it's taken a nerf of over 50%, right? But the overall numbers are nothing like that. The, the peak at, of everything together is 120 trillion, 120, you know, two. And now the the current total of everything is, you know, right around 90 and 92. So overall there has been some nerf, but is it 50%? No, it's like, you know, 20, maybe 25%. So NullSec has, you know, taken the nerf bet very, very hard and people have compensated by going to stuff that other mechanical changes have impacted at the same time. We haven't highlighted these as part of scarcity, right? But like abyssals, huge floor to what you can do on your own for income without having any sort of space yourself, right? Uh, the introduction of, of triangle ships has actually made wormholes easier to sort of, uh, it's called roach fleeting, where you're just uh, roaching your way through any given hole. You don't stop, you don't put down roots anywhere, you're not living there. And at the end, or if you happen to get tackled, you know, you kick the one guy who's tackled out of your fleet and the rest of you filament home and you're done, right? Oops, filaments. You know, have we talked about that as part of scarcity? No, but it, it plays into, you know, this is how the sandbox works. A lot of this discussion, I think, is totally natural. And this is what I, I wanted to, to come back to as far as iteration. Many of these, if you go back and look at the CCP blog posts, I think Dynamic Bounty System in particular, that's up on the screen here, they said, oh, we have all this new tech. It's super easy for us to adjust the numbers and to play with this and make sure that everything is good. And, and in fact, on paper, the DBS numbers make it look good for NELSEC in terms of what you could be making via the old system. But in practice, that is, that is not how it has turned out. And have they adjusted it? Well, I don't really see a lot of adjustment happening on this graph. Uh, they right? have adjusted, but it's pretty half-assed. <laughs> All right, I'll take your word for it. There we go. Okay. So Next yeah, slide. it's and that, oh, that applies to... Uh, no, I was just saying that applies to all these systems. Each of these things 
when, when we came on the show six months ago, right after failed to relaunch, I, I wanted to be positive. And we said in, in some of these cases, these system changes, we, we see that they can be good. Right. And I don't think we even fully understood the, the impossibility of trying to build a fleet of dreadnoughts from the, the mechanics at the time, although we were working on it. Right. But I was assuming that they were going to follow up all of that with tuning that was going to juice players ability to produce the raw materials to, you know, to build oh, stuff faster, to, so you know, set up the, I, I, that that's not really true. I didn't believe that I hoped. Right. Uh, and in fact, if you're looking at this, that's exactly what you should do following these changes up. But sadly, here we are six months later at a great strategic advantage to ourselves. Of course, it's great for us that no one can build a Titan. Uh, but it's not that great for Eve, and we're committed to not wanting to ruin the entire game. So, oh well. All right. Now, and angry, I have some a question. Slides for us, or wait, wait I a have a question. We're, we're, okay. So after all of that, and I, you guys are the smartest guys I've ever heard talk about this, and I think the audience is quite enjoying listening to it because it's on point, and you made some pretty hard hitting points. So, imagine you're on the CSM. Imagine you are CCP. How do you fix this? What can you do like right now to start turning the ship around? What do you guys think? That's putting you on the spot. I know it. That's, that's, I know the, it. that's the part two of the two parts special, right? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> we got to do but, another uh, show for that. We got to do another in, show in for that. One, Angry, what in, you got? In, in one sentence, I would say CCP would need to uh, learn to love the fact that. Uh, inflation happens just it's a fact of life and it's really hard because um because inflation feels bad but there's a reason that all real um governments have what are called inflation targets if they're not run by incompetence uh in that in that you can try to control inflation but the way to do it should never be deflation and you should never pull up the ladder behind someone make work that was done years ago more valuable than work that is being done now. Um, you always want to promote activity at the current so that you have so that um, how should the, uh, the way to phrase this is um, uh, so that by by making activities now worth more than activity years ago, you promote activity, which gets people involved and that's what you want. And basically stop listening to the people who did some PVE like five years ago, um, extremely broken by exploiting some mechanics. And now all they want to do is sit on their cash of this and just not have to do anything but spend money for the until the game dies. So, is, so what, uh, yeah. so stop for listening that... to retired ease on how to run your economy. Cause <laughs> they're not the ones engaging in it. That is a hundred percent, hundred percent. So, all right. So, so if I'm, if I'm hearing you right, I, I agree. Inflation is not as big a deal as, as it's being made out to be. And the fact that people can generate a lot of ISK is fine. Let stuff cost more. If people have more money, they can still afford things because they can go buy the same stuff. It just costs more, but it's, as long as you can generate the wealth, it's not a problem. So I would say my, my solution would have been exactly what you said, angry. And that is, value work that's being done now over work that was done a while ago, instead of rewarding people who are sitting on massive piles of trit, why not create a new thing that they have to go get that they can mine that is required for all these things that, that gives that can only people can that are playing right now can do something like that. They, they didn't have to touch any of the wealth generation. They didn't have to touch any of the mineral distribution. They simply could have added new things to existing BPOs and BPCs adding new things that you needed in order to build stuff. And all you do there is reward the people who are here right now that can go out there and they can focus on bringing that stuff in. And there you go. That, that solves a lot of those problems, I think, but that's not what they chose to do. And I don't think they can go back and change that now, unfortunately. Well, it's not, kind of frustrating. not yet. Well, about technically, right. They technically did that, but the numbers they chose were so out of line that it's, Impo that it's that, it has that, 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 so that what do they need to do like double everything. triple i mean what do they just add well add more stuff is that what it is that the solution it's 
it's really com- that answer is really complex. And I think that's why it's a two part special in terms of where the answers are at the industry stuff specifically. Uh, it's tricky. Some of the mistakes are hard to unwind, right? But I, I want to agree with angry in, in principle. The thing here is to say that you can't, you can't undo capital proliferation or inflation as a general thing. That is a, it's a law of MMOs. You can control it, right? You can do stuff mechanically to influence it. But if you try and turn back the clock, right? Uh, it, it is, it's like trying to put the genie back in the bottle. It just doesn't work. You're going to try and try and try. And at the end, you just have a mess and you've got genie everywhere and no one is happy. Right. And that's what has happened here is that no one is happy and they tried to turn back the clock and it doesn't work to the, the real fix is to both. You can embrace mechanical changes to slow the rate of inflation. Right. I'm not out here to say that building however many hundred Titans in a year and a half is actually great game mechanics. That's not, you know, but to both slow that down, but also make sure that that can be competed with. We are not here because we want to have a thousand Titans and have no one be able to compete with us, right? We want to see a game where at some point, some other group of enterprising players is going to be able to build however many hundred of a tech two Titan or a tech two dreadnought or whatever it is that can challenge us, right? Or challenge the existing power holders. And, And that option is what's not on the table, not for our sakes, but but we need people to fight, right? And that option is just missing right now. So there has to be a, a philosophical, I feel like, change of saying in, inflation is part of the world. We can slow that down. Eve does not need to be wow, where there's a new expansion every six months and everything changes. That's ridiculous, right? Uh, and, and in fact, all of this is a reaction to seeing the power curve go a little too fast for everyone's comfort. But the overreaction is the wrong one. Got it. All right. That was... Pretty fucking good. Let me just tell you, that was pretty amazing, guys. Thank you. Um, I, I I can't think of the last time we had such a, a an in depth discussion on the show. Normally, I, it's just Mittens and I yelling at my ass all the time. We don't we don't get a chance to have. I, like, I, and we love that, that for you like, both. I, I I didn't need to understand all of that. What I did need to understand was that the people that understand the kind of things that you guys understand were howling and bay like that was some red meat for the the crowd right there. Uh, and also, I'm extremely impressed to see Angry Mustache take that PowerPoint deck and ram it right up Iceland's ass. Right, that was that was very <laughs> impressive. And uh, congratulations. Now I want to, now I want to put you on the, the official Imperium ballot for, for next round for the CSM, because that was murderous. And I want to say, I, I, Hey man, anytime you want to come here and have us help you, Rest you know, piss, nod, angry, smile and nod, by the way. Yeah, smile, smile and nod, uh, our way through any, any PowerPoint action. Uh, that was a tour to fucking force. Uh, actually this kind of reminds me of uh, back in the day when we were at loggerheads with CCP about remote doomsdays, uh, a goon hero named Bayon Glorious. I think this was back in 2008. It was what eventually resulted in uh, Titans being brought back down to Earth. But it was another scenario of CCP just not listening. And he wrote a goddamn manifesto, right? This was back when people still used forums and wrote things at length uh, as, a, as a culture. Uh, and it was a true manifesto. And that was what this brought me back to here, Angry Mustache. So fucking bravo. And uh, if you have part two, if you want to do any other slide decks about this, I feel uh, absolutely confident. CCB, please, just as a, as look, we beat the entire fucking galaxy in a war that lasted a year and a half. One of the reasons that we were able to do that is because these two motherfuckers are running Goonstorm's finance, right? We have other smart people like that who you haven't even met yet. Maybe... Listen to the guys who figured out how to do econ and finance on fucking nightmare mode for the last year and a half. And maybe listen to them about unfucking this shit. You know, all you got to do, you don't have to understand the stuff. I don't understand the stuff. You just find the people that know what the fuck they're talking about and do what they say. It ain't that's that how hard. That's how we and, do and it. That, that's all I got, guys. Thank you so much, gentlemen. That was much. amazing. And I, uh, I look forward to watching more PowerPoint beatdowns. Everybody, thanks for coming to our fucking TED Talk. That's good. Thank you for having us. All right. Yeah, thanks for having us, guys. Now, stick Great around. Time. We're not done yet. Uh-oh, you guys are going to get extra meta show because you didn't, get, right. you didn't get it in the beginning because of, uh, of, uh, of the AT. There's one last thing that happened this week that I want to talk about because it's important to a, cons- a, a very – Niche, niche part of the game, but it's a very important part of the game, and it's a very important part of our group of of people. And so we're going to do a quick piercing the corporate veil segment, and then we're going to get out of here. So 
I want you guys to stick around with us. We're going to talk a little bit about ganking and ganking mechanics here in a second. All right, I know this is going to be controversial, so we're just going to get this out of the way. One of the things that has been a common theme in EVE Online since it started is there is no such thing in EVE Online as non-consensual PvP. When you undock, you are consenting to fight. There is always the chance that someone is going to blow your ship up. It's fundamental to EVE. It has been fundamental to EVE. It will continue to be fundamental to EVE. When it's no longer fundamental to Eve, Eve will not be Eve. Okay? So one of the things that we see, and one of the one of the most common things in high sec that gets new players complaining, gets old players complaining, is the prevalence and the occupation of a small handful of players, highly skilled, that all they do all day is gank. They kill big ships with small ones, and they do it right under the nose of Concord, and they've made... Trillions of us doing this. They have they have created their own gameplay style. It is a thing. It has been part of EVE for years. There have been changes made to ensure that the balance of power is, is fair between the people who are getting ganked and the gankers. I think, if anything, right now, the, the, the power has, has shifted a little bit to the, to the anti-gankers, to the, to the players, as opposed to the gankers. But we saw this week a major change, potential major change to the meta that I don't think was intended that started when a couple of gank gank people that, that were out there doing this, and I don't even know who they were. We've got a lot of this stuff through the grapevine. I think there were code members or former code members. I think, I think safety is the new code group that got banned. And they were banned under an old a, 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 an, an old uh, uh, rule here. And let me pull this up. We still have our, our stash show. Let me throw this on the screen. This is a exploit notification and I pulled this off of the Wayback Machine. This is from September of 2015. That says that delaying Concord response, distracting Concord by jettisoning ships or other items in space to distract them from attacking the perpetrator is, a, is an exploit. You can't do that. As of the date and timestamp of this message, the practice is considered abusive criminal flagging system, and it'll be an, an exploit. Now... One of the things that gankers have been doing for the longest time is resetting Concord in a system where a gank has just happened. Now, what does that mean? The way the mechanics in HiSec work, if you gank someone on a gate, for example, Concord spawns in, kills all the catalysts, kills all the coercers, whatever ships you're, tornadoes, whatever ships you're using to gank, and then sits there. And they will stay on that gate until downtime, unless they are moved somewhere else by another gank or into another system because of another gank. So what the gankers typically would, and, and the result of that is, if Concord is already on grid, their response time is quicker than it normally is on a clear system. So what the gankers do is they would reset Concord by going to a station in their pods, getting in rookie ships, undocking, letting Concord go over to that station, kill those rookie ships. The gate is now clear where the ganks happen, and Concord can respond in a regular time. That has never been considered an exploit. It's not considered delaying. It was never considered delaying Concord response. It was a way to reset Concord response so that people could actually do what they were doing and not have the negative impact of instantly dying I mean, as opposed yeah, this to is just stuff. literally how ganking works right if you it's ever you if you've ever ganked like this is your like yeah like we're spelling For out nine the years, exact obvious ten years. Thing, right yeah yeah mm -hmm. so what happens we see and this happens every couple of years a game master gets petitioned by someone who's been ganked and gets the wool pulled over his eyes and fleeced into believing that the mechanism of resetting Concord, moving them around, is somehow delaying them. It's not delaying anything. All it's doing is resetting Concord back to what is status quo ante of you attack somebody, they warp in on you and kill you. They say this is enough. They gave a warning to a player who was only doing pulling 
and claim that this was an exploit under the policies. This has never been the case before. Now, obviously, when this happened, this set off a massive impact in the ganking community. A lot of people complained about it. They complained about it to the CSM. They complained about it to us uh, on Rampage. They complained to anybody that would listen, including a number of Debs and other GM team members. And I want to make sure the good news is it looks like CCP Paragon has responded to them to confirm, and I'll pull it up on the screen here. There is his, his post is at the top confirming that pulling or resetting the grid has never been anything that CCP has historically had a problem with. He flat out says the method of moving Comfort off a grid is not something we've historically had problems with and still don't, as far as he's aware. No one should be getting banned or warned for this alone. And if you have, DM him. Now, I'm happy that this looks like it's being resolved, but I'll tell you, one of the biggest issues that I have in EVE, and it stems from when I was banned in 2018, is when you have players engaging in behavior, they don't know that it's wrong. They, they're they not being given warnings. They're simply banned out of nowhere and then told, well, you should have known the rules. It's been the rules since 2012. But what's the recourse for them? Where is, where is the person advocating on their behalf unless it ends up getting onto Reddit or it turns into a big thing? And that's why I've been pushing for a long time for CCP to have an internal ombudsman or at least an appeals court or something where players that get banned can go and say, look, here's the deal. This is what happened. This is why I don't think I deserve this. And have a critical eye looked at what the GMs did. And it has to be somebody that's not on the GM team. That doesn't yeah, want to back GM up the person seems that did to understand, it. Yeah, like th this GM seems to understand the mechanics of the game that he's playing about as well as uh, the higher-ups at CCP understand the economy of the game that they're attempting to manage. I mean, it's a shit show. Especially if you've got somebody who's new and the, the, the problem is in so many cases, CCP will fuck things up and because they don't like getting called out on fucking things up because they're, they, it's a kind of a passive aggressive place. You kind of avoid the incoming criticism and dodge it if you can. Uh, they don't like getting hammered on. They don't like getting hammered on in public. Like, you know, the, the whole age of chaos thing, the blackout thing, and gosh, everything's fine with the economy. It was like, act like everything is fine. Please don't make fun of us in public and humiliate us for fucking up instead of going, whoops, sorry, newbie GM. Maybe there should be some sort of a oversight process, especially for the areas that they do not have a perfect understanding of. Uh, it, it, it's ridiculous. And it has real world consequences. People seem to forget, like, this isn't just ha ha ha, newbie GM fucked up and it's okay. They got some messages about it one of the things this illustrates is is that there are people who are authorized to just you know whatever ban people and fuck things up and they did it to brisk they did it to brisk and they had to climb down from the entire thing and it was a huge real world problem and he was completely innocent and so when we see stuff like that it's not just like oh ha ha, ha ccb you know rogue gm or whatever it is a structural problem, which reflects a lack of oversight and uh, changes that need to be made. Because right now, apparently, the GMs are of a good enough handle on this as, as the rest of them have on the fucking games economy. It, it, it's not just something to... My initial reaction was, haha, rogue GM. And then I forgot, oh, wait, look what these people did to my fucking co-host a few years back, Right. That was complete horseshit. He was completely exonerated, and it was exactly the same sort of crap, right? It, it's just it's unfortunate. It's it's disappointing. And and, uh, and to me, you know, and that, that's this is this is something I am never going to stop being, you know, banging the drum about. It's when it comes down to it, the amount of time, the amount of effort, the amount of everything that we put into this game. You guys listened to two guys give doctoral theses on the economy in this game for an hour and a half. Can you imagine what it would be like if out of the blue for doing nothing that they have not been doing for 10 years, they get up and banned? And then what? And then everything that they've done is, is flushed down the toilet. You cannot have as your philosophy, Eve is forever, if you are so easily, willy-nilly tr tricked into banning people who are not doing anything that they haven't been doing for a while. Now, I want to I want to praise CCP Paragon, I want to say thank you to him. That's the first categorical statement from a CCP member that what these guys were doing was okay, and I appreciate that he did that. Now, what I'm hoping is that these bans can get reversed, 
and that now that this statement has been made, that everybody can go back to recognizing that what these guys are doing when they reset Concord is not a trick, it's not an exploit, it's no different than any other situation where players have taken the mechanics, figured them out, figured out how to get around them, and created their own organic niche gameplay out of that stuff. I mean, this is fundamentally what he was about. And that's what these guys do. And whether you like it or not, you may hate the gankers. And I, if people don't like it, you think they're they're horrible people, they're attacking folks that can't fight back, whatever you want to say about it, that's fine. But this game allows scamming. It allows theft. It allows spying. It allows treason and betrayal. It allows all kinds of stuff. It's what makes the game fun. That's part of what makes EVE different. And suddenly, out of nowhere, having... A random GM decide that he's going to reinterpret uh, uh, a ruling from 10 years ago to, to to start banning people. It's not okay. I'm glad Paragon did that. I'm hoping that CCP recognizes this. We get this totally resolved. These guys get allowed back in the game. And we don't have to worry about this again. And the gankers can go back to ganking. And the anti-gankers can go back to trying to stop them. And we can focus on the fun stuff like fixing scarcity. There you go. All right. Now... You guys got a lot of extra time today. Yes, got, yes. And that's and and frankly, that's fair because you missed the first 15 minutes normally of the show, but you got another 20 out of it. And you got to hear from a Angry and Kazanir, two of our favorite people. That was amazing. So that was great. So I want to thank you guys for coming. I appreciate it. This has been the Meta Show for November 6th, 2021. I want to remind everyone, as we leave today... Tomorrow in the United States is daylight savings time is ending. That's right. The capital everybody. of EVE Online, the capital of Imperium News Network is in Madison, Wisconsin. Madison observes <laughs> daylight savings time. Therefore, <laughs> next week, Finally the show will still be else. 4 p.m. Eastern Freedom Time, 3 p.m. Central, but it will be 2100, not 2000 EVE. So don't come here at 2100 thinking you're going to see the show. You're going to be like, why are you guys not on? We'll be mm -hmm. on in an hour. All right. Mm -hmm. We will see you Wisconsin next week. Time. Yep. All right, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. This has been the Meta Show for November 6th. I'm Bruce Grubal, joined by the Matani. We have Kazanir and Angry Mustache here. Thanks for watching, and you stay classy, New Eden.